these uh, living microorganisms, they are living beings, so they need to look for food, they need to escape from poison, and they must have some way to control and to sense the environment a lot around them. And the way that they look for food or escape is what they call chemotaxis. So they have some sensors of the chemicals around it, and what they do is that they move around and fill the concentration of these sensors, and by, by they are very small, so you cannot sense the concentration along their own body. What they do is that they probe, probe the concentration by movement and then decide what the direction that they want to go. Uh, we have used this with two different microorganisms. One is, uh, is called the uh, Sorry. One of them is called Leishmania amazonensis, responsible for a disease called Leishmaniasis, and the other one is uh, Trypanosoma cruz, which is uh, causing this disease called Chagas disease. Uh, they can spread low, almost over to the border to the United States, here, all South America, and the border of the United States. Yeah. Uh, and here, what is nice about this one here is that it goes inside the insect, it does get attached to the lid gut of the intestine of the insect, and as it moves to the hind gut, it changes its form from this uh, epimacillot form to the lipomacillot form. This is the infected form, this is not infected for humans. But this one is the one that goes with the feces, and then if you scratch off your skin, then you can get the disease here. And so we want to see, they have the salivary gland here of the insect. We want to see if it can sense the presence of the walls of these insects. And the way that we did that is using the octotwiz and the quadrant detector. As soon as these microorganisms tend to move in the exact force, with the quadrant attack, you can calibrate this and give a direction of the force. Not only the strength of the force, but the direction of the force as well. Uh, and to, so instead of trapping directly the microorganism, you need to trap the lid, and the lid must be larger than the microorganism. Otherwise, each time that it passes through the light, you're going to have scattering that's going to give you strange uh, features. And so uh, here we did put the Leishmania in a concentration of sugar, and we see here that the behavior is completely random if they don't have any concentration of sugar. And after the concentration of sugar, they start to have this behavior like going in circles instead of uh, random swimming and stopping and swimming and stop. That's a good way to sense the environment here. And if you measure the force here, the push of the concentration, you can see sometimes it goes down, but most of the time they will tend to direct themselves to the direction of concentration of sugar, and the strength of the force also changes as this. Uh, here you have the Trypanosoma cruz, we can bring it close to the wall of the insect, and it, as soon as it gets close, something like 20 microns from the wall. It starts to show this strange behavior, and you can see that it tends to attach its tail or its flagella to the wall of the intestine. And we did put it very far away from the intestine wall. You can see this uh, rapid movement. It seems to not have any chemotactics at all. And if you bring it close to the liquid cells, then we start to see this chemotactic uh, behavior. If you put it uh, there is a Tiponosoma cruz here, close to the salivary glands, do not show much of a chemotactic behavior here, but they have a cousin that's called Tiponosoma rugelli that actually <coughs> binds to the salivary cells, and they did show some chemotactic behavior here as well. So I would this in that, end up this part here by saying that after we have to uh, make this kind of movies available at the internet, I discovered myself to be in a UFO site. 
They say, if uh, they can trap bacteria, why not uh, uh, OVNI can come in front of you, shine some light, and make an ambivalent. Actually, the title of the app was Light Sets. So it's, that's the thing that you have to wear about and put for your name into these uh, sites. So changing subject here for the output links of this spectroscopy and B resonance, I did put here the list of papers for you to go there. And back to the first uh, talk, we are talking about using this uh, expansion, partial wave expansion, and the force will be given by these uh, mean coefficients here. Tim talked about it a lot yesterday. And I asked him to, my mathematics is not working this computer here, to plot me the uh, sum of these uh, mean coefficients A and B as a function of x, x is given by the size of the particle divided by the lambda and the repetitive index of the particle here and is the uh, repetitive, relative repetitive index of the external medium compared to the internal medium. And you can see here that after your size parameter starts to become bigger, before x equal to 10, you don't see much. After 20, you start to see these features. At when this part here of your A and B coefficients can become pretty, pretty much close to zero. And this feature will become much stronger. If that's I did for, we did for 1.5 divided by 1.3, wasn't it? Yes. yes. If you have this in air, then your difference between less and air is going to be 1.5. Each time that you have this N much larger, you can have very sharp features at higher size parameter numbers. Okay. And this size parameter you can change because you can change lambda, for example, and then you can change the size parameters. Uh, so we expected that you're seeing that it's 40, 40 times here. Uh, you have to pi. That's about six. So you are talking about r around 40. Uh, 36 by 6, 6 times the wavelength here. The size of your path is about 6 times the wavelength. So it should be the region of geometrical optics already, but the geometrical optics will never show you this kind of uh, uh, behavior that you can have here. And then let's talk about spectroscopy. What we do for, to perform an uh, spectroscopy measurements? Usually, we have to rely on any interaction between radiation matter to have any spectroscopy. So we need, you usually have an incident wave, and then it interacts with the medium, and then we have a detector, and we try to detect anything, any change here. Wavelength, change, absorption, scattering into the other direction, whatever we can do in order to get the information. Sometimes, for example, photoacoustic techniques, you measure the amount of heat that's absorbed by a medium, Scattering techniques, you don't change the wavelength, but you change the direction here. That's absorption, you can detect direct, or you can detect even thermal change here, or you can detect other waves like in fluorescence and any other kind of uh, interaction. But there is one interaction <coughs> of radiation matter that has not been used for spectroscopy. That's the moment transfer. You use it for good reasons, but we do not use it to perform spectroscopy, for example, because the part will going to change its direction as soon as the light gets scattered. Yeah. It's usually much easier for you to scatter the light, but we want to show the proof of concept that we can use this interaction uh, to perform spectroscopy. So the idea here is use one trap beam to keep your particle uh, in a stable position and bring a disturbing beam in order to change the position of your particle, and another beam to sense the movement of your particle. The nice thing about this uh, thing is that the particle is completely isolated in your medium, and you can make this disturbing beam much weaker than the trapping beam. That means that you can only see, you, you can make this, by doing this beam much 
stronger, you are sure that you did not move much from the equilibrium position of the other. And to perform spectroscopy, what you need is to have this disturbing beam being scanned and changed with the wavelengths. And so what we did was we used two lasers, a Tysapar tunable CW Tysapar laser and a YAG laser. The YAG laser was to keep the particle into the track, and the other one would change uh, <coughs> its uh, position due to the force of the other particle. One nice thing about that is that then we have completely freedom to position our trap for the second beam in any place respect to the other beam. Okay, we can change this direction, you can change this, and you can change the z direction. So, and the particle here you don't have to hold it with any other thing other than the normal VR of the pieces. And of course, you can change the particle by the two means that I did show you, we can change Z, we can change X and Y, and we did the way the calibration used two photon excited fluorescence with a very small uh, layer of fluorescence dye in order to calibrate the Z position with our uh, collimator there. And by doing that, the first, well, one of the first experiments we did was just to see the fluorescence. And then we start to see these two features here. One of them is due to the A coefficient, and the other is to the B, which we call uh, TA, T and TA modes of the microscope. And you see that it comes in pairs. So TN, T, TN, T, TN, T. That's we saw in luminescence. And then we made this what we call plane wave of the false spectroscopy. But we did this put the uh, Tysapar laser all the way down uh, much below the Yag laser. So the particle here is going to see something very close to a plane wave. And each time that this plane wave comes here, the scattering force will drop the particle down, and so the movement of the particle is going to be up and right in the Z direction. And then change the wavelength of your Tysapar laser. And as we did that, we guess the experiment of results we got here, and these are the calculations with the new coefficients for the scattering here. You see that the position are the same. And we can do more now, bring the two lasers together in the same plane, and change its direction laterally. But we can change in such a way that the displacement is in the same polarization direction of your disturbing beam, or it is at perpendicular direction of your disturbing beam, and we did put another at 45 degrees. And then make the same kind of spectroscopy there, and what we saw was, by doing one, instead of having the pair of uh, mini resonance here, we have seen only one. The other one, we have seen only one, and we have been made with 45 degrees to be come back to see the pair of two peaks of this new resonance. And that's very easy to explain if you remember the coefficients here, this was not yet the, our uh, capital G coefficient, but anyhow, they are proportional, the T coefficient is proportional to the uh, dot plot between the uh, radial direction and the magnet field, and here with the electric incident field. And what happens if you put your field like this is that your magnet field is perpendicular, so this is not, this mode will not going to appear, and the left field is radial, and so you're going to have only the TN modes. If you put your left field here, then the left field is going to be perpendicular, and the magnet field is going to be radial, so you're going to have only the T modes, that's this, this other case here. And if you put at 45 degrees, both of them will have a component at the radial direction, so you can excite the two modes there. And when we made the other experiment with the called plane wave, what happens is that you have light uh, reaching your sample on all positions, so you're going to have light here, you're going to have light there, you're going to excite both modes of it. So you can use this to excite only one kind of mode using that. 
And I let me keep that. Too much calculation for, for now. I want to skip that and so we'll come back to the other discussion that uh, it's nice to have alpha tweezers. Alpha tweezers actually open up the possibility to measure, the, to open the door for the micromechanical world, world. We can measure now, since the beginning of my cross back in 1600s, we never be able to measure the mechanical properties with force like picomutants, which should be about the force involved in some kind of spermatophyte mm -hmm. like this, because its mass is so small, it's 10 to minus 15, so the force cannot be more, much more than picomutants there. Uh, but that's not enough. It's not enough information just about the mechanical, biomechanical properties here. Because although the bacteria needs to attach itself and to exert forces and torques, the fact is that the biofuel to do that is biochemical. Cells can talk to each other, and usually they use biochemistry to talk to each other. Okay, so most of the events here are driven by the biochemical uh, changes and biochemical information here. Although at the end of it, it must change this in some mechanical movement. Even for the metastatic cells, they must move and they must move in that direction, so we can't miss this. So it would be great to have these two tools together, one that can give you some information about what happens in the bio, from the biochemical point of view, and the other from the biomechanical point of view. That's why we want to couple the two techniques together, and if you think about spectroscopy uh, in one microscope, you will start to think, first of all, what is kind of information I want? I want information about the molecule bindings. So I don't I know that there is a lot of carbon there. I want to know is this carbon bind to what? Is oxygen, is nitrogen, is hydrogen, is carbon in what? So this kind of information usually they come from the vibration of the molecules. But the vibration of the molecule is all the way down to 10 microns. So for microscopy, that's terrible. So one way to bring this information to the visible so you can do microscope and get the biochemical information is using RAM. So just remind you that in a, a normal oscillator here at the resonance, before the resonance at lower frequency, you can always have this uh, small response here, like the amplitude is uh, proportional to the force divided by the last constant, but after the resonance, it does not respond. It fell down at least with 1 over omega squared. So usually, if you put your frequency on this side of the resonance, it will have some response, and on the other side, it will not have any response. At the resonance, of course, you're going to have the peak, of the response here. And what happens with a molecule normally is that you have the vibration of the nucleus, and the nucleus has a mass that is much heavier than the electron mass. So this vibration happens all the way down to 10 microns, and we cannot write it because we are using a rate like 0.5 microns here, 0.7 microns on this side. Here. So the nucleus do not respond to the laser, but the electron, usually the resonance of the labs go to the UV light. So we are on the other side of the lab, the electron will answer to our laser uh, oscillations and not the nucleus. But the nucleus does move by itself. So the nucleus changes its position because it uh, can technically uh, vibrate. And we are using a light here and not there at the red, that resonance. How can we bring that uh, information to you? So you have a light pole, and this light pole is a function of your electron position and nuclear position. Let's say that the electron position is proportional to your immediate <coughs> driving field, and the nuclear position does vibrate by its own. If you have this polarization, you can make a Taylor expansion fit. So the first thing is going to be just Forget about the 
zero term, suppose that we don't have any uh, static polarization. So the first term that we're going to have here is going to be proportional to the left of them. So that's going to be one dipole and it's going to radiate at the same wavelength and that's where it's scattering. Then you can have a mixture of the second derivative of the polarization respect to the electron coordinate and the nucleus coordinate. That is going to give you this cross term between uh, the, your driving field, driving field and your uh, nucleus movement field. That would be one. If you make another term here that changes with just twice the derivative of this thing here, you're going to have cosine square. Cosine square you can always write as 1 plus cosine of 2 omega t that's going to be, give you the second harmonic of your light field. Usually you call second harmonic when it's very well directed, when it's uh, scattered, you should call it hyperwave instead of second harmonic liberation. But somehow people call it second harmonic liberation. That's the name now. And you can mix also twice this then here with one of this then you're going to have the cosine square and the cosine of the nucleus. Here with the nucleus you have information about the vibration of the molecule. And of course <coughs> if you take this cosine and add them, you can so this term here and each time that you have a multiplication of two cosines you can write them as a sum of the frequency and the difference of the frequency. If the two frequencies are equal, that's going to be that's going to be your cosine square, and that's going to be 1, which is a 0, and that's going to be twice the frequency here. Or if you have a frequency that is uh, the frequency of the nuclear plus, the frequency of the laser, then you have a term that has a sum of those two frequencies and some stokes in the stokes there. Yeah, those are the gamma. And the gamma, they have this general trends here, depends on your constant of uh, winding constant between the molecule. So a double, double bond is, uh, has a higher frequency than a normal single bond. And the mass here, so everything that is connected with hydrogen is going to be at much higher frequency than the other. So when all the connection is defined with the hydrogen is going to be around 4,000 to inverse centimeters. Uh, wave numbers here. So you have pretty much this is a drama, is a big area you have. You can have a software now, you look at the peak and the software will tell you what you are seeing there. So and you can see the different modes. And today it's kind of easy to perform your drama with your microscope, even to perform a uh, confocal drama. For example, here is Olympus. You bring your light back, you, you, you send your lasers to the microscope, they go to some point, stop at that point, bring your light back, and after it passes through the pinhole, everything from here is confocal. Take this filter, take this filter, put the filter to kill just your laser, and take this zero here, and you can get the beam and put the spectrometer there, and you can have your own. And for the design system, it's the same thing. After you pass the pinhole here, everything is uh, confocal. Uh, you can slide this zero out, and use this port here and send it to the. Uh, you will be using this 30 centimeter spectrometer now. If you use a edge filter, you can kill the laser and you are able to see that spectrometer. See? So we just send the laser here and collect it and fox it the slips of the monochromatic and then we could see. The RAMA we did, and that was a homemade. Problem system. So the first test you have to do is just to look at one very known Brown silicon, for example. And actually, you can see different orders of silicon, and that tells you how good your instrument is. And we have seen one of this, and we can track a red blood cell here, for example, and stop at some point and take a Brown spectrum. Or we can track a simple microsphere, latex microsphere, and keep it there and take the wrong. Now you can trap the spermatozoid and at the same point, the same time, not the same time, because you see that this run here was taken 120 seconds. You can make the spec and see spectral changes of biochemical reactions, reactions happening. 
Uh, but because we are using the femtosecond wave, we could try also to see the hypergrama. Hypergrama waves is going to be very hard for you to see just using CW laser, that's a two photon process. And we have been able to see the hypergrama of the strontium. That's uh, just 10 times smaller. This, this, is, this is in the wavelength here, and that's in the rubber sheet here. That's the hypergrama. That's hypergrama is like to be the rama of the second harmonic of your incident here. Uh, that's usually we got this hyperrama spectra here in about six seconds. And uh, if you go to the literature and see what about the hyperrama, people usually wait for hours to get a good uh, hyperrama spectrum. What happens is that they usually have used this uh, 10 hertz laser or 20 hertz laser. Instead of using the 20 hertz laser, we are using now the 8 megahertz laser laser. And then you have much more signal to noise. You don't have to wait that long to get hyperrama of this material using this new lasers. So now let's talk about the different thing. You don't want to do spectroscopy, you want to do microscopy. But you want to do microscopy select, chemically selective. For example, I know that this peak here is responsible for something important biologically. See, I, I am going to put a filter here and see in space where is it. Or oh, I can use different peaks here and look at the space. That means doing microscopy. To do microscopy, drama, which is a great technique, is not that great because it's uh, not that efficient and takes for long. Suppose that you want to have only 10 milliseconds for each pixel and you want to make a, a picture 1,000 by 1,000, a 1 megapixel. If you try to do that by 10 milliseconds for each pixel, you're going to have to wait for three hours to get this nice image. So what people do with RAM is usually they compromise the resolution of their picture and in order to get it in some time like 10 minutes or half an hour to do that. So in order to have this kind of uh, microscopy done in a much shorter time scale, we need to increase or enhance your drama by a factor of 10 to 4, 10 to 5. But uh, it's possible to do, and uh, people have done some she at Harvard in the final year of this field. The idea is that we cannot increase drama because the, our laser cannot drive the nucleus. It's too much about the resonance. What about using two lasers and using the beating between these two lasers? The beating between the two lasers can fit right away and become in resonance with your uh, vibration, your molecular vibration. So if you can adjust them, you can enhance your run by a factor of 10 to 4, 10 to 5. And then you can detect here, you, you have two frequencies here, you have a lower frequency that's going to be stokes, and you have a higher frequency that's going to be unstokes. And by being at the higher frequency, you get rid of any fluorescence, because the fluorescence will be excited on the other side of this one here. And by enhance this uh, Roma factor by 10 to 5, now, uh, the other thing about the being the cut side of it is that when you start the, the pr process, it's like this. One laser with higher frequency here to a different state, and the other laser puts it back to the uh, vibration state. And then the first laser back to the virtual state, and then the signal is generated from here to there. You can see that's the last process. You won't have any energy delivered to your sample. And you see that you need two red photons so the signal is going to be proportional to this uh, red photon squared and one green photon there. If you want to have the other side of it, then you have to start here, and the second we put you here, and the other here, and it will fall down to this. And then what happens is that we start from the higher energy level, which is technically uh, less populated than this level here. So the cards, you have two nice things, the strongest signal here for this process, and uh, it's in the 
right side with respect to the fluorescence, so you can get rid of uh, the fluorescence. So the only thing you have to do is to use a filter to kill all this, these two lasers here and get only your signal there. And uh, the best way is to do it, uh, first people start to use femtosecond lasers, but the point is that if you have a 100 femtosecond laser and measure the line width of it, it's going to be something like uh, 150, 200 universe centimeters. And with that, the normal Roma line of your molecules are around 10 universe centimeters. That means that most of your pulse energy is going to be out of resonance. And they will generate a background that you don't want. So the best thing is not to use femtosecond laser, but go to 5 to 10 picosecond lasers. You need the two lasers to be tunable in order for you to match exactly the vibration that you want. Uh, I started that with two Thai Sapphire lasers that they should be locked to lock, and I can tell you just forget about it. It is too much pain, and you don't get your uh, work done. Uh, so I give up and got, uh, I said that it takes for me less time to write a project and get the money to buy the new OPL system. And the OPL system is always pumped by the same source, so everything is time synchronized. The only thing you can have is a shift in time, but then you use a delay line and put everything into the same time. So I'm getting this, uh, I just bought it. I hope it will come. They said that a uh, high queue that they have too many orders, so they usually it takes three months for them to deliver the equipment, but they are asking for six months. Now. So with that we can I actually wanna have uh, two OPOs so I can have the signal and the idol from one OPO, the signal and the idol for the other PO and the fundamental line of the laser. So we can match more than one Brahma line at the same time. Because you never do spectroscopy only based in one drama line. In order to discriminate between two substances, you need more lines to do that. Otherwise, they, most of this material, biological material, they have about the same line there. Even if, if you go to the fingerprint region, there is a, a completely forest of drama lines that you don't separate between two substances. Although here we have one nice thing that the whole thing is focused down to uh, one femtometer. So we don't have that <coughs> many substance. And so I can show you only some cheese results out of it. Usually they have done this with uh, lipids. And so they will match the two lipids here around the 3,000 inverse centimeters here. And so I want you to just compare this kind of picture with this one. And that was taking something like half an hour and the kind of picture is taking one second. Okay, actually Sanji had did demonstrate a uh, real-time video rate uh, cars microscopy. Uh, the only thing is that they usually look at the lipid layers of it and if you try to use fixed samples each time that you put alcohol into your sample, you, the first thing you destroy are the lipid layers. So they must use mainly fresh samples in order to do that. That's a nice thing because you can say that you can go to uh, living uh, stuff instead of dead ones. But the point is that the doctors, they are used to treat their samples in that way. So I can do that with second and third generation, but I have to tell them, for free, for example, I have always to tell them, I have this <coughs> collaborator, and when they said, well, free does not have any real meaning if you have fixed samples, then they have to stop and think about how to do with fresh samples. They have to change their procedure. And because it's a uh, nonlinear process involved, actually three incident photons, it's always possible to reconstruct three dimensions. It's a radical focal. And in this uh, movie, you can see Sunny Shi's uh, website. And you can see the lipid layer of the cells. They, are, they have three cells here, and the storage of lipids inside the cells. So with that, I would like to say that you have a nice picture 
of the potential we can have today to put all these tools together. It must be integrated in just one equipment. Otherwise, you have to first do one and then bring to the other one to see the other technique. And then the process did happen already, so you don't know if you are starting from the same point. But information you know, from biology perspective is uh, very valuable today. Almost uh, in Brazil, for example, one thing that uh, who was asking me, where is your student this time? Um, from the, my first talk, he thought that I would put all my effort to study cancer. But the point is, these tools can be used to study any biological process. Okay. So, but if you have this kind of tool, you can choose what is the field that you want to use it. And then you can choose this by the most impact it can have. So I said that for cancer, I decided that in Brazil, in my case, I will try to put all my efforts in three kinds of research. One is cancer, because cancer is the first uh, death cause today in the developing world. And second, in Brazil, is to understand uh, uh, bioethanol production from several, well, we have lots of money to the new center for this uh, sugarcane and ethanol for different sugarcane. I don't know if you are aware, but in Brazil, we can run our cars all the way from 100% ethanol to 100% gasoline. They call it flex car. The efficiency of the engines are not that great, but the point is, if the sugar price comes up, usually the ethanol price goes up is together, and so if the price of the ethanol is higher than the gasoline, you just use gasoline. And then at some point, the sugar price comes down and the ethanol price comes down, and then you have your half tank of full of gasoline, you go there and put the rest of it with ethanol and fill it with ethanol. Usually we don't mix both of them, or you use 100% ethanol or 100% gasoline, and depends on the price. Because what happened in the past is that each time that uh, India had a problem with sugarcane production, and then the price of uh, sugarcane came up, and the price of ethanol was higher than the gasoline, everyone had to change their motors. You, you had to change the compression rate in order to change uh, the fuel that you're going to use. So we learned that it's uh, good to pay the price to have flexibility. And in Brazil, that means something like 30 billion liters of ethanol production a year. Uh, with the less expensive ethanol production in the world. Because we have sun and we have sugar cane and land to produce it. So that's why I try to be on those two directions. But I can only go to the direction that I have a, a strong enough collaborators for another to back up me. And it comes time to manipulate the biological side of my research. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. In the report, I talked to the experiment, we used another laser to measure the displacement. I used another laser to measure the displacement. I could have used just the, I didn't have it at that time, just the quadrant detector with the Yag laser. Okay. I would not do the same way today. Because okay. you have the Yag laser, it's already trapped there, and then yeah. you put it in such a way that it's zero. So each time the disturbance moves it, I can have already very easily this way. But that was done back in 2005. So I would not do the same experiment again, just for fun. I had to have a student that. So by that time, I, I used the quadrant detector, but with a neon uh, laser inside the sample. Okay, if you'd just like to thank our speaker for his entire series of lectures.